thanks a lot dr rajiv dr shalini uh, it's it must be very late sunday evening at the moment i think india has already started well we in, i know it's we are in semi final of um, world t20 um, bit disappointing that you know uh, we lost one of the matches we are looking forward to winning the cup and in 20 minutes in bhuvneshwar there is a game of hockey which is going to be played between india and spain so i'm a sports fanatic all together so i can rather than talking about pitch tree and pancreas one of the days i can fill you up about hockey cricket tennis anyways um thanks a lot for giving me an opportunity to speak in here i thought i'll just change the flavor here you know um i've heard talks from esteemed colleagues about diabetes management sclt2s clp1s i'm just trying to change the flavor to a bit of endocrinology here so next slide anyone can control this slide next slide please thank you so uh, i want more faces in here you know shalini don't disappear uh they i saw purvi also and a um, couple of other people around it's much better to talk to an audience than me talking to the wall in my own uh, study room so i'll prefer people to be switched on at least i'll see see them and ask questions and you know it will give me a bit of stimuli so when you think about pitch tree gland and the pancreas what comes to your mind you know i can ask purvi she's listening at the moment Dr. Chavla, what do you think? What comes to your mind? And you know, I'm not asking to test your knowledge or anything. I'm just trying to build a forum and platform to talk about. Is there any context, or is it just my figment of imagination to join two topics, pitch tree and pancreas, and create a talk out of it? You are at silent mode, Purvi. anyone who wants to take it up or as i said i am keen for people to interact in here anyways uh, next slide please so uh, around 83 year ago in new england journal of medicine there was a mention about which tree gland linked with the pancreas so uh, that was the era there were lots of animal based studies now it was interesting to note i'm not going to read the whole paper but if you take the um, pitch tree gland anterior pitch tree gland away from an animal they were more prone to develop insulin induced hypoglycemia in addition if you gave anterior pitch tree extract in these animals uh, they the glycemic control worsen so even about 80 years ago there was an interest in the anterior pitch tree extracts and the hormones being produced from them having an impact on our glycemic control and you know uh, next slide please so uh, in diabetes clinic when we are sitting in 99.9% of the time we'll be dealing with type 2 or type 1 diabetes the joy of being a diabetologist or an endocrinologist is challenging the diagnosis to begin with is are we clearly thinking it's type 2 type 1 can it be monogenic diabetes mitochondrial diabetes is it secondary diabetes due to something wrong with the pancreas as an endocrinologist it's exciting to know that there are other things which can lead to uh impaired glycemic control so i've just created two clinical scenarios i want to keep things very simple both the clinical scenarios are based on real life experience so a 35 year old comes to the clinic with aches and pains arthralgias on two medications oral medications metformin and glimepride and premix insulin body mass index 24.5 kg per meter square and the glycemic control is poor 
no family history of diabetes nothing coming in and this is an individual who was seen on multiple visits prior to it so um, let's say it's about 2 years since the diagnosis 9 out of 10 time in our practice we probably will think about the compliance will think about uh, going through the injection technique maybe switch him to sclt2 his bmi is 24.5 kg per meter square it's a caucasian individual so um, i'll say it's within the normal range so anyone who wants to interact here okay let's move on to the next slide please so when we investigated this individual um there was nothing clear as you can see from the history rather than the arthralgia non specific complaints per se his prolactin levels were mildly elevated his tft were within normal range his igf1 levels were elevated 9am cortisol not a very good test as such for excluding acth cortisol deficiency because the results can be equivocal but in this scenario it was more than 310 and this is what we normally are using uh, to establish the integrity of acth cortisol excess so next slide please <laughs> so you know it's very difficult to do a online uh, talk because there is no interaction here but in this kind of um, patient who was being followed up in our um, diabetes clinic when we put in our endocrine hat we were able to establish the diagnosis in a sense we investigated him further his uh, he turned out to be Uh, acromegalic and as we know the diagnosis of acromegaly at time from onset of symptoms to the point when it's established it takes 5 to 10 years mm. so in a sense my question here is how does the growth hormone excess influence the glucose metabolism what are the things which we have to keep in mind to pick these individuals in our practice um what are the clinical characteristics which come to our mind and then how is the treatment going to be different from people without growth hormone excess so next paragraph next slide please so in a sense um in clinical practice we do know acromegaly is extremely rare but it's immensely satisfying diagnosis um i i think we probably diagnose maybe 3 to 5 cases per year locally probably there are cases which are missed and part of the problem lies with the primary care not picking up the symptoms because to begin with the classical signs the prognathism the change in the jaw change in the size of the ring finger uh shoe size they are very subtle signs they are soft tissue signs they may take long for us to pick it up uh, the active acromegaly normally presents with headache sweating and arthralgia this these are the signs of active growth hormone excess most of the time the only characteristic which can give you help in clinical practice is these are the individuals who are relatively lean as compared to typical type 2 population we deal with it's not excess visceral adiposity it's the metabolism of glucose at level level and insulin resistance which is the key marker in these individuals so uh, normally individuals with acromegaly present with a relatively lower bmi as compared to typical type 2 population they are relatively younger also next slide please so i'll not go into pathophysiology at 7 pm in india because you know this is not the time for you to waste your sunday evening going through deep pathophysiology but in a sense we do know growth hormone stimulates the gluconeogenesis induces lipolysis and leads to insulin resistance next slide please so may i so, just 
ask you a question. I love questions, Dr. Chavla. Great. Uh, so, sir, I, you know, before you go into the details of acromegaly and uh, glucose disorders, uh, so would you just tell me why, uh, yes, the patient was referred to you in the diabetes or endocrine clinic, uh, but, uh, you know, why exactly did you, you know, what is the differential diagnosis? If you can just quickly run over that. Because yep, so I can completely vouch and tell you that nobody will think of acromegaly at the first stage the way you have picked it up. So, sir, if you can guide our physicians on, you know, what would the differential diagnosis be? Thanks, Dr. Chavla. And uh, let me tell you, it took us two years of clinic visits before we picked it. Uh, patient was being reviewed by S, our Thursday morning clinic. And this is a case from University Hospital a few years ago. We've got a Thursday morning diabetes clinic. Patient was coming in, being followed up every six months. There was an escalation of level of glycemic control from metformin, glimipride. You can see this is around 2011, 2012, if I'm not wrong, or around that time. So we were not using as much. SGLT2s only came to UK in 2012. So I've not mentioned about use of that medication after SUs had failed. We went on to premix insulin. The key thing was, as I've shown in this slide, that patient was relatively lean. And my, in my mind, I was thinking about that, is there something else going on? It's, it's not looking like a monogenic diabetes. It's not latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. We did anti-GAD antibodies, which were negative. Uh, Men, mitochondrial diabetes, extremely less likely. Again, you know, this is uh, uh, theoretically not possible. So we started to think that this patient is requiring higher and higher um, dose of insulin. And I don't remember the body weight of this patient exactly, but the insulin resistance meant that the patient was requiring more than one 1.5 unit per kilogram body weight. Mm -hmm. So when you see somebody relatively lean and thin, you've excluded latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood with anti gad antibodies or you know whatever way you want to do it. Five years from onset of symptoms, uh, you can even do the urinary C-peptide level. But in this, I we thought more about um, uh, growth hormone excess or cortisol excess as reason for such high insulin resistance. So the question which was coming to our mind was, why is this patient having such severe insulin resistance? What is driving it? So simply saying that, uh, as I have mentioned in this slide, that these individuals are relatively thin, right? Uh, and they present at a relatively younger age group. As I said, the patient didn't have the classical phenotypic feature of acromegaly. IGF-1 was marginally elevated. And as I mentioned before, it takes about 5 to 10 years before we even pick up acromegaly from the time of onset of symptoms. So, Excellent. Uh, Oh, it's not, it's just lucky. You know, we as physicians, as clinicians, we shouldn't take credit for anything because we, if we, in a way, it protects us from not taking discredit for things when they go wrong. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So, uh, yes, the treatment, obviously, surgery and somatostatin analogs have a role for um, the, the disease, which is residual or not cured by surgery. Uh, we do know somatostatin analogs bind to the somatostatin receptor 2 and 5. There is theoretical risk of hypoglycemia and disease control and lower BMI are predictor for glycemic improvement. Next slide, please. So we've got option of pesteroidite, but it again, in setting of type 2 diabetes, it leads to more hyperglycemia related adverse event, events. So Widely speaking, everyone with acromegaly, uh, you know, should be cured by surgery. But if there is no cure which is achieved, you go for uh, medical management with somatostatin analogs being first line. But pesteroidide is something which is not preferred because it's associated with more hyperglycemia-related adverse effects. So we've got pegvisumant in such scenarios. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
I'm very conscious of time. I've got five minutes left. So just to sum up, I wanted to change the flavor altogether here. Uh, acromegalix, 12 to 37% have type 2 diabetes. Impaired glycemic control is even more common. Growth hormone leads to insulin resistance. I mentioned about the surgical cure, which is preferred, and uh, somatostatin analog in for medical management with pegvisumant being the second line agent. Let's move on to the next one. Next slide, please. So second clinical scenario, as I said, I've got only two and I'm conscious of the four minutes I've got left to cover this topic. 42 year old type two, low mood and fatigue, on metformin, isophane, and liraglutide, BMI 38, HPA1C of 10.2%. Very classic type 2 picture. You know, there is nothing I've given which is uh, 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 special in here. Next slide, please. As I said, I didn't want to spend too much time, you know, giving you uh, time to reflect in here. That patient of ours had proximal myopathy, easy bruisability, thinning of skin. So we thought about hypercortisolism. And we do know, again, it's a rare diagnosis. It's not something common. Probably pseudo Cushing's is some uh, we encounter uh, far more commonly in clinical practice as compared to genuine Cushing syndrome or Cushing's disease. Uh, there are multiple epidemiological studies related to hypercortisolism and type 2. And uh, uh, hypercortisolism, some studies have quoted, are seen in around 3.4% uh, of patients with diabetes and one4 of patients labeled as type 2 may have Cushing syndrome. I think it's a bit of exaggerated figure. In clinical practice, Cushing's disease is extremely uncommon. Uh, Again, if you start imaging in patients with hypercortisolism um, in a genuine Cushing's uh, syndrome, it's more pitch tree adenomas. Uh, next slide, please. So all I was trying to say was that in patients with type 2 who've got typical uh, pseudo-cushinoid uh, kind of appearance, we do have to think about possible Cushing's uh, or hypercortisolism. It's rare, but it's an immensely satisfying diagnosis to make. This is what will distinguish us from the generalist per se. Uh, and this is my favorite slide in here, that ticking cloth clock hypothesis, that the macrovascular complication, the dreaded macrovascular complications, start with onset of insulin resistance. And even before we diagnose someone with type 2, there is probability one of 10 may already have established cardiovascular disease. Next slide, please. As I said, I've got time which is limited. Let's skip this. So, uh, as I said, my second clinical scenario, I've cut it through kind of uh, because of the time limitation. Um, we, we do know that in clinical practice, we've got more pseudo Cushing's appearance, but there are some clinical activity scores which we have to keep in mind and um, pick up the patients with proximal myopathy. That's very easy to pick when you see somebody in clinic who's uh, struggling to get up from the chair, suggest proximal myopathy. You look at the skin and the skin is bruising easily. There are hard signs, but it takes at least three years before somebody's diagnosed from the onset of uh, symptoms. Cushing's disease. Um, pitch tree related ones are the more common one. Ectopic Cushing presents in a very aggressive way. Uh, more importantly, I think what COVID taught us, it's, this, uh, it's, it's the itrogenic Cushing we are worried about. And uh, the amount of time individuals are on steroids, which are sold as herbal medications and, you know, over-the-counter medication. I, I think uh, you guys will know more than me about how common it's to encounter itrogenic Cushing. Next slide, please. And take-home message, you know, just give me 
30 seconds to go through it. I just wanted to give you two different clinical scenarios to, to talk you through what growth hormone and high, uh, high cortisol can do. It's, it's important to know, you know, the eyes will see what the mind knows. So consider hypercortisolism if you've got some specific signs. I mentioned easy bruisability, proximal myopathy, and the stria. Uh, there are screening tests and confirmatory tests, which I'll not go into details at the moment, but it's just being aware in the practice and thinking that pitch tree gland can impact the pancreatic function. Thank you.